Hi, this is Jason, and today I want to consider the question of what makes Christianity so cringe. And the reason I'm asking this question is because I, I run a ministry where I go out to recovery homes and I present a gospel message that includes both how, how we are sinners and how Christ is the solution to our sin problem. And I really want to avoid evoking a cringe response. And I'm looking at two videos today that I think will help me unpack that um, that cringe response. And you're welcome to come along and watch the videos with me and see for yourself what you think. This For me, it's prep work so that I can get ready to do a blog entry on this and then also create a list of recommendations for people who are taking the program that I created out to other recovery homes. And so at this point, I'm just, uh, it's very early in my process. I'm just trying to sort through the different things that are, that are out there and then later come up with a set of recommendations based on having thought it through. So uh, welcome to my process. If you're finding these videos interesting, please click subscribe and hit the notification bell. That helps you be notified of content and it also helps people who are new to the channel find the channel. Now, to begin this discussion of what makes Christianity so cringe, I, I do want to acknowledge that the Bible predicts this. The Bible says that the cross is foolishness to those who are not Christian. It's a stumbling block. Jesus himself said, well, if they persecuted me, speaking to his disciples, imagine what they will do to you. Don't be surprised. If they kill the master, imagine what they're going to do with his servants. Uh, my purpose here is just to remove those aspects of what I do or what I might do that would be cringe invoking. So to get at this question, I want to play a video of Todd Friel from Wretched Radio. He's, he's talking about the differences between AA and biblical counseling for someone who has an issue with drinking too much. So I'm going to play that for you stop and have a little reaction to it. And then I'll show you another video of a young woman who was um, accosted by a street preacher, essentially, and uh, named Ray Comfort, had an interaction with him. She has a YouTube channel and she now reacts to the video that he put up of him uh, attempting to convert her to Christianity. So but let's start with the Todd Friel because I think that's a good place to begin the discussion. Yeah. All right. This one is from Kyla, who says, hi, Ratchet. Uh, Christians who suffer from the sin of drinking alcohol and excess, are they to look solely to Christ alone for help with turning away from this sin? Or is uh, something like AA helpful? Yeah. I, I, you know, you have to admit, AA has helped some people. But it's kind of like a blind knife finding a squirrel in the shed twice a day. Instead, there is a much better biblical approach to dealing with addictions. First of all, they're not. That is a clinical term. When somebody is consuming a lot of alcohol regularly, the Bible identifies them as a drunkard or a wine bibber which makes that behavior a sin. AA is not going to tell you that. They'll tell you, hey, aren't you tired of the effects? Aren't you weary from waking up with a headache? And well, that's maybe true, but it doesn't help you to mortify the sin that causes the headache because they don't label it as a sin. The Bible does. And that's good news because God helps people in overcoming sin. So I think this is the first part of how a message, a gospel message to people in recovery could become a bit cringy. What Todd Friel has done is he said, let's define it biblically. And anything that's not biblical, we're going to take out of the definition. Then we're going to use the biblical definition moving forward. And that is the way that we will cure the sin of drinking too much. I think that's an error. I would say let's let's give the devil his due here. There is a, a clinical phenomenon called alcoholism apart from the sin of drinking too much. 
and it has certain clinical aspects to it, which you can diagnose when you work with someone. Someone who is who's who has drank a lot of alcohol for a long time may in fact need to see a physician to get off of the alcohol because the physical dependency on the substance is something that needs to be monitored by a doctor or they could have serious medical complications like seizures and delirium, uh, strokes, heart attack. I mean, all kinds of bad things can happen if you try and quit alcohol without medical supervision. So to say, you know, if it's not a biblical definition, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm going to be purely, purely biblical here. I think is unnecessarily reductionistic. And you end up getting into a position where you're, you're prescribing things or you're giving suggestions to people and you've left on the table uh, things that are going to be helpful to them, like a medical detox, like having your alcohol consumption tapered off under the supervision of a doctor. And I, and I don't think we want to do that. I think we want to admit that, yes, it is a sin problem. And we'll see in a minute how people react to being told they have a sin problem. It is a sin problem. I, and, and I applaud Todd for saying that clearly, because in this culture, you're going to get a lot of pushback from that statement. You're going to hear people, it's not a moral problem. It's not, I mean, it, you'll really upset people if you'll say that there's a moral dimension to drinking too much. By saying that addiction is not a choice that anybody makes, it's not a moral failure, it's not an ethical lapse, it's not a weakness of character, it's not a failure of will, it's just how our society depicts addiction. So if drugs damage the areas of the brain that we need in order to exert free will, then it's like driving a car without brakes. You don't want to hit someone, but if you don't have brakes, how do you stop the car? So I applaud him for saying that, but it's so reductionistic. And then it leaves this whole medical side of things uh, off the table. In addition to that, it, it doesn't take into consideration the fact that there are people who are absolutely hostile to God, absolutely hostile to, to the gospel message, who, who have clinical levels of alcoholism, and who get better. And it's not acknowledging that. And I think we should acknowledge that. The, the, the data shows that about 60% of people who have a problem with alcohol quit on their own without any program whatsoever. And some of those people are doing it through church. Some of those people are doing it different ways. But let's acknowledge that uh, that pe people quit without the help of God. We, we have to acknowledge that. To not acknowledge that and to say it's si simply a sin issue and God deals with sin and that's how we're going to move forward. It, it's just, I think we're just unnecessarily restricting ourselves. And we come off as cringe to people then because they're, they're going, well, there's clearly evidence that fits outside of your conceptualization and you're just denying it so that's it, it feels cringy to them uh, that said again i want to applaud todd for standing up and saying it, it is a sin he goes on in this video later to say that it is in fact a worship disorder i'm going to play a clip of that before we get to the young woman who was uh, accosted by the street preacher so out of the gate, a biblical counseling approach would be, let's interpret the subject in biblical language. You're not an alcoholic. You're a drunkard. Now, what is going on in that heart? Being a drunkard, that's a fruit. There's a root. And one of the roots, for instance, is what? Idolatry. It, it, it's a worship disorder. You've had a hard day. You want to cut the edge off of it. Who wants to cut the edge off of it for you? The Lord. Who can cut the edge off of it for you? The Lord. We're to seek him for our comfort. We're to seek him for our joy. We're to run into the strong tower when we are feeling like we've had a really miserable day, not into a bottle of booze. All right. Amen. This sounds exactly like things people would say in the Resilient Program. As we're going through our meeting, they're going to say, yeah, I ran to a bottle of booze for my comfort. I ran into a bottle of booze for rest. 
And in fact, the R in resilient stands for rest in Jesus and his promises. Because we're encouraging people not to uh, have an idolatrous relationship with a bottle of booze. Because the booze, you can worship it if you want to, but it will take from you. Just like all idols, they all demand something of you. They're going to take from you more than they give. God is the only God that gives more than he takes. So you run to him for rest and relaxation and comfort and to take the edge off a day. Run to him. That's the, He's the God who gives you that. And then on top of that, gives you more mercy and more grace. And he fills your life up and he, and he gives you life to the fullest. So I want to applaud that. Just to reiterate, I think what makes it cringe to people is when Todd says it's simply a sin and these other aspects don't exist. People hear that and it just sounds, you know, old fashioned. It sounds like a preacher in a black hat um, calling down hellfire on his parishioners for, for things that they've done wrong. Um, and, and, and it just seems, it just doesn't line up with what people have seen, which is that Number one, there's more to it than sin. That's kind of a heavy statement, but I will say there's a physical, there are physical ramifications to the sin of drinking too much. And, and God has provided doctors and nurses and therapists and social workers to help you deal with some of these physical ramifications of that sin. There are also psychological and sociological, like work and relationships and so on, fact, crim criminal behavior that also can result from drinking too much or, at, or, be a, or be closely associated in some way with the drinking too much. And God has provided people to help even non-Christians with those things because he's gracious. And so I think that's where part of the cringe comes from. Now, let, let's take a look at the video of the young woman who was spoken to by Ray Comfort in an attempt to convert her. And she found the whole experience very cringy. Let's take a look at that and see what that adds to this discussion of what makes it cringy. All right. Now I've got this young woman pulled up who had an encounter with Ray Kroc, uh, not Ray Kroc, that's the McDonald's guy, uh, with Ray Comfort, who spoke to her on the street, videotaped it, and he put it up on his YouTube channel as an example of how to convert people to Christianity. She is actually a popular YouTuber with like many tens of thousands of subscribers, and she reacts to that video. But I want to show you a clip of, of her talking about the video before she shows the video. There's lots of videos go there. This is really meta. I'm reacting to a reaction of a vid. It's a lot going on, but just just watch what she says. L listen to the implicit attitudes and ideas that are underneath what she says, and I think we'll learn a lot about why uh, non Christians find a presentation of the gospel to be so cringy. Um, before we get started, I do want to say that if you are a hardcore Christian, and honestly, I'm expecting that because of the person we are going to be reacting to today, whose entire channel is dedicated to converting people to Christianity, teaching people about Christianity to each their own. I'm going to... Okay. <laughs> okay, let's start with the hand you know, teaching Christianity, converting people to Christianity, and we just see a hand, whatever, that's whatever, to each his own. To each his own is not actually to each his own. That's not what she's saying. To each his own means, if that's what you believe, I respect that. That's not what she's saying. She is clearly indicating contempt for the idea of teaching and converting people to Christianity. And I think that is something that we are all going to confront if we bring the Christian message out to people who aren't Christians. Well, let's, let's watch a little bit more of what she does and says to try and understand a little bit of this contempt that she has 
for the gospel and for even trying to present the gospel message to someone, which she calls trying to convert someone to Christianity. Let's take a look at it. I'm going to be respectful as I know everybody has their own beliefs. And I don't think, you know, the Christian belief is bad. I just don't agree with it. And which makes this video even more comical. Don't try to convert me. Don't try to baptize me. I know after Ray, which is the guy who made this video about me, posted his video, um, I think for nine, 10 months, even up to like present day, I have people that comment on my YouTube channel that come over from his channel and try to get me to repent my sins, convert to Christianity, all this shit, say that I need God in my life and all this stuff, right? Do I think some people have good intentions? Yes, I do. I do not hate Christians. I just don't agree with the religion. Um, however, I don't really appreciate that here on my channel and I'm not going to tolerate it here on my channel. So if you have an opposing opinion, that's fine. Don't shove it down my throat. That's All right. So I think what you can hear here in her video is the language of consent. This is a huge value in our culture today. Consent is paramount. We care if a thing is happening. And I say we, I'm talking about the United States of America, uh, Europe, Canada, even most of the world right now, the, the, the culture in the world cares deeply about consent. And things that are done without consent are very bad. And you can even do a very good thing without consent, and it becomes a bad thing in the estimation of this world. You, you heard her say, don't try and convert me. Don't try and baptize me. Um, don't shove Christianity down my throat. She wants to put her hands on the control levers and be in charge of what she does with her life and anyone who is going to attempt to uh, instill in her a different set of values or to contradict her or attempt to, to change her in any way is going to get a fight. And I guess I should walk that back. I think she's okay with people contradicting her. I think it happens at the level for, for this particular woman, at the level of consent. I have not consented to change my ways. Therefore, you are wrong, and I will shut you down if you attempt to do anything without my consent. And I think if we're going to go out into the world and attempt to present a gospel message to people who are not Christians, one of the things that we can do that's going to shut things down immediately is to not deal with the issue of consent. If we don't have a way of dealing with consent, we are going to get unnecessary um, hackles being up and people being in either a defensive or an offensive or maybe a shutdown posture. But we have to deal with the issue of consent. And I can tell you, when I start a resilient group, that's where I start. I share my personal experience and I'm, I'm walking back and I'm backing off any suggestion that I'm going to tell them what to do. I tell them, I offer this to you for you to consider it. And I, I, I also, I set it up so that if you, if you do not want to be in this group, you should not feel compelled to be in this group. You should be here because you're interested in exploring the resources of the Christian faith. And that type of an approach seems to just knock off about 90% of the reaction that you're seeing right here. And it's not what happened to her. Uh, I don't think she got full consent. In the video uh, later, she talks about how this person talked to her and she, she thought it was kind of cool. He had a YouTube channel and then the tables got switched and all of a sudden he's trying to shove Christianity down my throat. It's an issue of consent. 
And we can get into a, you know, a debate about that and about whether it's valid for human beings to not consent to their creator sending a message to them. Uh, I've even heard people tell me, no, I am told by Christ to go out and share the gospel message. I don't need to ask anybody. At a certain point, I think that that logic falls apart. I mean, I don't have to, I don't have to ask permission to share the gospel. So does that mean I go to your house and I don't knock on the door and I don't ask you if this is a good time and I go into your living room? I'm commanded by God to present the gospel message. I don't need to ask. I mean, at a, at a certain point, everybody is asking. I, I mean, even though Ray did not get formal consent from her before he began sharing the gospel with her, he, it's implied in what he's doing. Do you want to be in my YouTube channel? Do you want to talk to me? He's, you know, he has to ask the person. He's not just chasing somebody down, tackling them and sharing this with them. They ha he has to do something in order for them to come up to him and want to talk with him. And so what I'm suggesting is just that that should be part and parcel of what we're always doing when we're doing this work is we're getting consent. I'd like to share this with you. Is that okay? Uh, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about Jesus. Is that okay? And if we get a no, we should respect that. I don't think there's any biblical um, mandate that says to keep talking if somebody tells you they don't want to talk to you. Um, and in fact, there's there's there are uh, discussions in the Bible about if you go to a certain town and they reject you for a certain amount of time, walk on to the next one. It says shake the dust off the shoes, off your sandals, and go to the next town. Uh, or um, if you're talking, even if among Christians, if there's a disagreement, you go to them once. Uh, you go to him twice now with somebody with you. You go to him a third time now with, you know, the elders with you. And if you can't get anywhere with this person, there's a point at which you stop. Now, there's no point at which we stop forgiving people. There's no point at which we stop loving people. There's no point at which we stop praying for them. You can see this in Jesus. People are, are rejecting him, putting him down, lying about him, mocking him, whipping him, beating him, crucifying him. He never stops. In his final statements, he's like, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. So our goodwill towards the person never stops, but our action toward the person uh, should stop if we don't have their permission. Now, would this person, even if we got their their permission, still find Christianity rather cringe? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the issue is. She says, uh, I don't agree with your religion. My guess is it's probably something around Christian se sexual ethic. Um, and, and I think also she at a very base level, she's just against anyone telling her what to do, whether or not it's about the Christian sexual ethic. Uh, she is just very much believes she should be in charge of her own decisions, which I, th I think is true for most people. And when you don't respect that, you're going to get the reaction of these people are cringe. Who would keep going when someone has told you that they don't want to hear any more about it? Who would keep talking about it? Who would keep texting you about it? Who would? That's cringe. So Given that, I think we're going to have to, as Christians, we're going to have to look for ways to present the, the gospel in a winsome way, getting consent all the way along the process. Thanks for coming along on this journey with me. I think I sorted it out a little bit more in, in my head. If I had to summarize it here at the end of this uh, discussion that we've just had looking at these two videos, I would say, you know, one... People are hostile to the gospel. We all are. I, I am in my heart too. I do things all the time that are contradictory to my faith. And there's a process that happens that gets me to, to confess that, to repent of that, and to get back in alignment with my faith. The, the, the sinful mind 
is just hostile to God. A certain amount of that is just going to happen and it's unavoidable. Secondly, if we, if we talk to people about the issues and their problems and it's only about sin versus redemption and we, we don't talk about their physical needs, we don't talk about um, other things that may be happening in their lives and may be involved in the situation, people are going to cringe, just like with alcohol. If we only talk about it being a sin, but we don't talk about the medical ramifications of it, we're, we're, not, we're not doing our best. And Jesus, in fact, healed people of their physical ailments and forgave them. He took care of both needs. So, so I think focusing only on the spiritual is going to get us a cringe reaction from people that are going, you don't even care about the financial aspects and the, and the relationship aspects and the physical health aspects. We're going to get a cringe response. And then I think um, what, what, what I learned from watching this woman is consent. If we don't have consent, we're not going to get anywhere. Before I, before I close this video, I do want to share a quote from Martin Luther that is ringing in my ears right now, ringing in my head right now. And what he said is, the law is for the proud and the gospel is for the brokenhearted. And in terms of the ministry that I do, working with alcoholics in rehabs, they're already kind of at the brokenhearted phase. So, you know, maybe you need the law to break through somebody's defenses when they're out there drinking or drugging or whatever. Maybe. I don't know. We can talk about that in a different video. But for the most part, for most people that I'm working with, they're already kind of broken down. They had to admit they needed help enough that they're now in a, uh, in a living situation where they don't have a whole lot of control. For those of you that came along and, and enjoyed thinking through this, uh, go ahead and click like and subscribe to hear more of my meandering musings about the gospel and about recovery from drugs and alcohol. Bye for now.